to the latest installment of the Audi Innovation Series. We're excited to continue our ongoing Canadian series that showcases global icons who have invented, innovated, and positively changed our world. As our company continues to drive sustainable innovation within premium mobility, it's been our pleasure to share stories of innovators in various disciplines. Today, we are honored and privileged to bring you one of our most distinguished innovators, our very own Canada's Chris Hatfield. After a noted career as a military fighter pilot, Colonel Hatfield became an astronaut in 1992. Over the course of his career, he achieved a series of Canadian firsts. He was the first Canadian to be a space mission specialist, to operate the Canada arm in orbit and complete a spacewalk, and to command the International Space Station. Now a noted author, an icon here in Canada, and an inspiration to so many around the world, he is just a great example. If you dream big, you can certainly reach the stars. We're also pleased to welcome back acclaimed, award-winning news anchor Dwight Drummond as today's moderator. Dwight has brought his talent and his passion to the Audi Innovation Series many times before, and we are so thrilled to have him join us once again today. So please, join me in welcoming Colonel Chris Hatfield and Dwight Drummond. Enjoy. Thank you so much for joining us on the Audi Innovation Series stage. Chris, welcome. Thank you very much. Great, great to be talking with you. It is such an immense privilege to be sitting here with you. You know that you're an inspiration to so many people on this planet. You've achieved so many groundbreaking milestones as an astronaut. Let's start with what it's like to leave that kind of lasting legacy. I, you know, I don't really think about it that way. I, I don't know if maybe someone sets out in their life to leave a lasting legacy. What I've always done is been really curious you know, what is it that excites me and what do I not understand and what do I think I might be able to help discover over time? And then how can I like work and change who I am to get closer to doing those things that are really important to me? And then how can I share the ideas, you know, with other people? And it's really fun then when, when other people get involved, you know, or follow along or are interested in what I'm saying or, or are curious about the discoveries. And, and, and it's now to the point, I'm sure, like you as well, where walking down the street, people, you know, they know who you are and, and they're interested in what you're doing. It's just a lovely privilege uh, at this stage of life to, to, to be in that position. I just count myself hugely lucky. Well, I mean, tens of millions of us have watched you in space, yeah. right? I mean, the, the Audi Innovation Series often centers around exploration and innovation and risk taking. It's an understatement to say that your career required a fair amount of courage, but would you classify yourself as a risk taker from an everyday standpoint? I think a lot of people um, conflate a risk taker with thrill seeker. Uh. And no astronauts are thrill seekers, not at all. I'm not just trying to get, you know, uh, my, my nerve endings. Yeah, your adrenaline or rush or adrenaline something. Rush. Yeah. You know, that's, that's not what I, but if something uh, is worth doing, it's almost always got some level of risk involved with it. You know, what learn to ride a bike or learn to ski or get Scrape married. Scrape up your knees a little bit on the there's skateboard, all, yeah. <laughs> there's always risk. So the real question is, what do you want to accomplish in life? And then what are the risks? And now are you, if you're good, if you decide I'm going to be the person that's going to take that risk, now what do you do? Do you just cross your fingers and hope it goes okay? Or in my case, do you then say, okay, I've decided I'm going to fly a rocket ship. I, I've got 25 years of work now to get ready for that. So it's not just a risk, but it, it's you know a risk that I'm involved in solving. So yeah, I, I, have, I have no <laughs> desire to just take risks for no reason. But if it's a risk worth taking, then I'm going to change who I am to try and defeat that risk and win. A lot of kids dream of being an astronaut. Well, if you ask a kid what they want to be, that's one of the things. Now, you grew up on a farm. I think you're a Sarnia kid, yeah. Sarnia, Ontario. Wound up as a fighter pilot and later became an astronaut. Talk about that dream, right, and, and the evolution that got you there and the time and the work that you put into it. My parents were raised as farmers, both of them. Uh, they actually met when my dad was a farmer working for my, my mom's father, you know. Wow. So uh, they recognized early on that raising their kids, a good environment to raise children in, was on a farm. And so they, they bought a farm and that's where I was raised. But they're, they're not just farmers. Uh, my mom is super well-read and educated. My dad is also an airline pilot, wow. a professional pilot. And, and they really thought it was important for us to understand work and, and the, the, the satisfaction that comes from work on a farm, but also see and understand the world. 
And we used to keep an encyclopedia close to the dining room table. It was like our internet. Before Google, right? Yeah. <laughs> so when someone said, you know, hey, hey, what's what's the answer to this question? One of us would go <laughs> right get over the encyclopedia, bring, open it on the table and get the answer. Wow. And so curiosity answered and also traveling the world some as the kid of an airline pilot, those really helped open up the ideas and possibilities for me as a little kid, I think. And they always expected us to pull our weight, but also to pursue our own capabilities. And uh, all my brothers and sisters are doing different things in life. And, uh, and I think my parents did a really nice job of, of giving us the you know, the roots and the wings to accomplish what we've done. Well, they gave us you and Canada really <laughs> appreciated it. Yeah. You shared before that on your third space flight, you use social media. I mean, we, we watched it all. At last check, it was over 30 million views of Space Oddity, something like that. Yeah. Um, what do you think about social media's impact then on science and technology? Because you've embraced it. You know, I, I, I look back in history because we're all wrapped up with social media, but think what it was like when we first invented written language. Mm -hmm. You know, when because not all cultures develop written mm -hmm. language, but where you now could learn something from someone who wasn't there or someone who lived 100 years before you. And then the printing press, 1440, by 1500, they printed what 2 million dollars. What a made in our world, yeah. That was crazy yeah. internet of the day. Or invention of the telegraph or the radio or the television or the internet, all of those things at the time we thought, well, this is the end of society because it's <laughs> disrupting our old pattern. But what they really did was they gave us the capability to share ideas and to communicate and it accelerated the pace of invention. And all of them were disruptive. I mean, we used to think television was going to destroy society, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we're still here. Um, and we've got to sort out social media. You know, how does this fit into culture? And it's imperfect and it's got downsides. It but the sharing of ideas, the accelerated nature with, then, with which then we can educate ourselves and then uh, invent things, that's going at a pace we've never seen before. And we need it. We've got big problems to we solve do. and we've got a lot of people to try and take care of. So, yeah, I mean, uh, you can focus on the negative. You can just focus on the positive. I think we need to look at the whole thing and decide how can this fit into society in as productive way as possible and not just despair because it's imperfect. Well, you, you have used it productively and we, we've enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. I mean, even David Bowie, saw, which is so cool. <laughs> yeah, Bowie uh, loved my tune. And, it was uh, what, a, what a huge compliment. Uh, I, the other compliment I'm going to give you that you, you actually have a nice singing voice, which you know, you. surprised some of us when you're out there in space. When you, um, you've excelled at so many things that you've put your hands on, from fighter pilot to author. And most people, they say, you know, if you've got that math brain, then you, you don't have the, the author brain. You know, it's, not, it's two kind of different disciplines. It's two different parts of the brain. Is there something um, about your personality then that allows you to excel in these different areas? Do you have advice for people who are pursuing multiple different paths, dip disciplines, etc.? cetera? Um, I, there's, there's an author, Robert Heinlein, okay. uh, you know, a science fiction author, mm -hmm. and he wrote this long diatribe at one point, but it ends with the fact that, hey, we're people. Specialization is for insects. Uh -huh. You know, as people, <laughs> you should be able to change a diaper and, and uh, you know, drive a truck and start a <laughs> Do fire all those and things, solve yeah. a problem and make a meal. And, you know, you should be multifaceted. And I approach everything sort of the same way. And that is, you know, whether it's flying a new complicated airplane or, or writing a book. And that is, what, am, what does success look like? What am I trying to accomplish? And then what skills don't I have to be able to do that thing? And let's start changing myself. And then try and learn the skills as best I can. And then maybe I'll discover, nope, this just isn't something that I have a good enough knack for. But maybe it is. You know, maybe if I, if I get enough education and, and training and talk to the experts, maybe I can do a reasonable job, whether it's singing you know, a Bowie <laughs> tune or writing a book or, or uh, flying a spaceship. And so I just approach everything with that same pattern. And the thing that you always have the most control over is yourself. The thing that you can change the most is yourself. And it, it's really easy to drop into sort of a blame game of, oh, well, that's, you know, that's above my pay it, yeah. grade or that's someone else's <laughs> decision. I think taking responsibility for your own set of skills and then trying to apply them to the things that are important to you and do those things as well as you possibly can. To me, that, I find great pleasure and joy in that. And most of it, it's something nobody knows anything about. It's just how I conduct my life and the little pleasures of every single day. And once in a while, you know, it works I out. do a video that 50 million people have seen. So, so to me, I, I just, it's just a, a, 
I think that's the engineer in you, the problem solver in you. And, you know, Oscar Wilde said to define is the limit. So don't define, limitless. What are you most excited for in the future of space travel and exploration? Um, I think the the thing that, right, excites me the most is, Mm -hmm. uh, are we alone or not? Yes, and we don't know life. the answer. You know, people think they see UFOs, you know, and and we're looking at other planets. We've seen 5,000 planets around other stars. The James Webb Telescope will actually be able to measure the atmosphere of planets that are around other stars. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a big question if we're alone or not. If we aren't alone, then what do we stand to learn? If we are alone, then we have a huge responsibility to not squander this shared intelligence and comprehension that we have and try and make sure we preserve it as long as we possibly can. So that's really exciting. Mm-hmm. But then there's just a lot of little stuff. I'd love, I'd love to. <laughs> you could go on, forget about that. You know, I mean, are you up- another spacewalk? It's just a great human experience. Are you optimistic about this future? Or are you concerned about it? It seems like you're more optimistic about it. Well, um, I mean, pessimists, it's hard to get stuff done if you're just a critic. I mean, yes. easiest job in the world is a critic. You don't actually have to do the work. Uh, to me, the optimists are the ones who can see a different future and are now going to try and do the work to make that future a reality. I don't know if that's optimism or pragmatism, but uh, I'm also aware from my time in space of the finite nature of the world, but also the incredible ancient history of the world. Four and a half billion years, and it's still here. We've been here for a minute. (laughs) When we say the world is ruined, that's kind of a a self-importance thing. The world's not going anywhere. There's been life uninterrupted for four billion years on Earth. So life's not going anywhere. The real question is, how much responsibility do we want to shoulder for the quality of human life in a sustainable way? That's the job that's facing us. And that requires a lot of work, but also, I think, kind of a, a vision of the future that you could call optimistic, or you could just call uh, necessary and realistic. And that's the world I live in. One in three risk of catastrophic event for a space shuttle launch. For my first launch. You wonder why three. anybody would want to leave this planet with odds like that. I mean, how do you face odd lo- odds like that? And what pushed you to face and just the importance of this work you knew to humankind? Like, Well, I, I knew a couple things when I was a kid. One was uh, I was going to turn into something. <laughs> you know, guaranteed. Yeah. So why not choose what I'm going to turn into? Don't just let life, you know, randomly kick me into some sort of job. Why not actually get involved? And number two, I'm eventually going to die. We all die. So get over that part and then try and match those two things together. What can I do in life that really accomplishes the stuff that's in my heart of heart? And how can I accept the fact that I'm eventually going to die, but not die in the short term, you know, pursuing the things that are important. So risk management becomes everything and recognize, hey, flying a rocket ship with the odds of one in 38 of of dying during ascent, we succeeded on SGS 74. So um, everything worth doing, you know, (laughs) has risk. And your job then is to try and turn of much of your dreams into reality. But really, I think, taking responsibility for making those risks lower for you and hopefully everybody that follows behind you. You inspire a lot of people around the world. You inspire a lot of young people. Your story is is one that Canadians are really proud of. Do you have any idols? Who inspires Commander? (laughs) Uh, When I was a kid, I I was inspired by imaginary people, you know, like uh, Captain Kirk. Yes. You know, or, or, you know, like- uh, I think we all love Captain Kirk. Superman or whatever, you know? And then when I got a little older and realized the difference between fantasy and reality, I got inspired by some of the real standouts in civilization. You know, some of the amazing people, uh, whoever, Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo or Mm -hmm. John Glenn or whoever you want to choose. But as I get older now, I realize every single person that I'm talking to, everyone knows stuff that I don't know, even if they're three years old. And (laughs) they have fought and won battles that I know nothing about. And as soon as you can, like if you and I had more chance to talk, I could really dig into some of the stuff that you've battled through that I don't know about, that I could really learn from and I, and I would really be impressed with. And so my heroes now are, are pretty much everybody I talk to. And the real question is, can we get to that part of their life that, that they're maybe not saying out loud that was truly heroic? Well, I mean, that openness probably leads to some of your success, being open to information and others like that. Um, did traveling to outer space 
change your opinions or thoughts about anything core to your identity? Because we feel like being out there is sure. just a life-changing experience. I think if they just plucked you out of that chair right now mm -hmm. and stuck you in a rocket ship and then put you in space for a week and brought you back, it would radically change you because you didn't have any of the preparation. You didn't, you didn't sort of ease into it. Mm -hmm. Whereas I decided to be an astronaut when I was nine <laughs> and I didn't fly, you know, 26 years later, I had my first flight. And then I served as an astronaut for 21 years. So it was a whole lifetime evolution of change and increased awareness and learning from other people. And then I got to go experience it myself. So yeah, it definitely not just changed me, but it, it turned me into the adult that I am. It wasn't like I was just beaming along through the dark and suddenly wham, I've <laughs> no, got a whole no. new you know, awareness of the universe. It's, it's much more gradual and, and uh, incremental than that. But I, I've, you know, I've been around the world 2,650 times and you would have to be a stone to not have that give you a different and more informed perception of the reality of the world. What do you hope is the most meaningful and lasting part of your legacy as an astronaut? Oh, that's a, that's uh, a big one. <laughs> well, I, I took some risks and I did things, you know, some for, from a Canadian point of perspective as the very first, like it's celebrated on the back of our $5 bill. I was, you know, Canada's <laughs> first spacewalker, only Canadian so far to command a spaceship. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, a lot of things I've done, I took risks because I thought this is going to be opening a door that then other people can go through it and then open doors that I could never get to. And so as a legacy, hopefully I have, you know, pushed back the edges of ignorance and opened up a little bit of opportunity that didn't used to exist. Hopefully some people can make better decisions or different decisions with their lives based on some of the experiences that I've had and lessons that I've learned. But I'm just part of an enormously long <laughs> continuum yes. and I'm aware of that. I'm just, just while my hands are pulling on the oars, I'm just trying to do the best job I possibly can. Final question. Having seen the planet from above and from a very unique perspective, what is the one thing you would tell everyone about space and our world if you had the opportunity? Having seen it from up there. What you become intensely aware of is uh, the world is incredibly small. If you can go around it in 90 minutes, it's not very big. You know, think what you did in the last 90 minutes. It's not a very big place. And we share it. We all breathe out of one bubble. You know, we're like that, those little frogs underwater where there's one little bubble that they're managed to breathe from or whatever. We're like that. We're all breathing out of one bubble. We are in this together. together. And we're not just passengers on this spherical spaceship. We are all crew members on a spaceship. And, and I think... As we become more global and as there are more of us, we all need to internalize our, our individual sense of responsibility of being crew on that one little spaceship Earth. To me, that's the really important perspective. What a poignant way to end this conversation. Commander, thank you. Thanks a lot. A pleasure, a real pleasure. Joy to talk with you again. Thanks. Incredible. And that ends our discussion for today. Our sincere thanks to Colonel Chris Hatfield for sharing his inspiring and interesting journey with us. And of course, another big thank you to Dwight Drummond for moderating this discussion for today. We certainly look forward to seeing you at the next Audi Innovation Series.